Hello, welcome back to another week of the DP World Tour Picks and Bets. Skylar Hoke here, alive and well. Tom Jacobs, how are we doing? I, I am very happy now that I have seen your face. Um, you know, there was there was a risk Thursday, I guess, afternoon your time uh, that we we may not see you this week. I think we did discuss about me doing solo for the rest of the year. Um, there was a lot of T's and P's going out, but you're here now. Um, because Guido actually returned to form. And when I say return to form, he returned to what he's been doing for the past however many months. Like, he opens with a 65, first time you haven't bet him in 26 years, and I, I thought you that was it. I, I didn't think you'd make it through Friday anyway to see the, the demise, really. Um, and then what did he finish, like 56 or something? So we're safe. Yep, yep. I think we... It was pretty. It was perfect. It was literally as theatrical as it could have been without being painful um, at all. You know, I, I guess I didn't wake up early enough on on Friday morning because there was a lot of scoring errors that were happening on on the app and on the website. Um, they did have them solo by like two strokes at one point Friday morning, but threw in a triple bogey uh, late on his card that he never recovered from. Apparently. Um, at the end of the day, I think I was able to go through the whole mental circles um, to understand that if he wins, I, I want it for him. I, I love the kid more than anything. I want it to happen. I do. And the, he will return to the betting card. Uh, disclaimer, it's not there this week. You know, not not a post. Richard, by the way, I'm mm-hmm. one proud, equal part proud and equal part shocked. I have no idea how you have not bet him this week. I thought that was it. I thought he was on the card. Like, open to a 65, that's it. Like, what more do you want? Um, it's only Monday, Tom. It's only Monday. So, <laughs> Let's know, not do a late show. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see if we have a Wednesday live show update. You know, out of nowhere, <laughs> five-minute pop-up. Uh, but no. So, I mean, I'm happy for Guido. Hope he can continue well. Um, but, you know, we're on to... Uh, a rather um, exciting week. I, I'm pretty interested here as we are uh, at the Catalunya Championship. We're staying in Spain. Um, Pablo Lorothable, you know, or Lor- yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. I always get him and Jose Maria mixed up, but um, he's just the, the world's best short game player in the world. Like literally, like any anything and everything when he needs it falls. Um, so not that uh, our guy Henny. Didn't uh, come more than one shot. I mean, he lost by two. Um, so he had a shot. But uh, that that dagger in the heart on 16 for Pablo, uh, unbelievable. Good win on him. He's just uh, just a loose cannon. You never know. I hope maybe we get him in, a, like, the majors this year. Do we know if that brought him in the world ranking? Uh, no, I can get it up. But, I, but I, just talking about it, we kind of mentioned at the start, he's 68th in the world right now. So okay. we kind of spoke, didn't we? Probably, well, I guess, what, when was it? It might have been... Raz week or Saudi maybe where we sort of said that this is like the most consistently played in a long time actually I think it was before the my golf life I don't think I bet yes. him I think I think we sort of said like he's playing the best consistent golf he's ever played sort of thing uh wins at misses the cut in Stein City fine not a problem fifth in Qatar first last week and he just has this ability right he just has that kind of given talent to just pounce when you're you're playing well and and you don't know quite how long that's going to last and people are probably not going to go back to the world in this week but everybody is 25 to 1 or bigger this week and it seems kind of wild to be able to get 25 to 1 on the Rafa Bell in his home country um when he's won twice in five starts twice in four starts yeah and i mean you you mentioned it with the consistency you know three other top six finishes you know one miscut um, in the middle of that, outside of that sixth, third win, miscuts, fifth win, like unbelievable stretch he's on. Um, I'm excited, you know, to, I think with that world ranking, he's going to get into probably the open championship, probably the PGA championship. And actually that, I don't know enough about Southern Hills just yet. Um, but it seems that his type of game with some of the talks, like I would almost put it, and this is a stretch, but like of the people on the, the DP world tour, like he's probably the most like speed in a way. Do you think that's a little bit similar with off the tee, not really being straight? I mean, he hasn't gained off the tee since October of last year. Um, I guess unlike uh, a weighted, I mean, let's see last week, 
Last week, he was just positive. But if you wait that for field strength, that's going to be negative overall. So there's nothing off the tee. Irons can get laser hot, but just so good around the green. And people say it's speed's best chance at a at a uh, uh, completing the Grand Slam. So maybe maybe Pablo T20 at the old PGA Championship. What do we say? Yeah, I mean, I think that would probably be the limit. I think when you look at his major record he he's not good at majors right i think he's finished top 30 in an open championship before um played one US Open, mr cup never never played the masters obviously but um you know he plays okay in the open championship he has made a 45th place finish in the pga i'd say probably a top 40 top 20 is not outside the possibility but you know you look at just i think we mentioned this before like the people he's beat like his first win came against colin montgomery four strokes beat sergio garcia in a playoff Beat Rory McIlroy and Phil Mickelson at Abu Dhabi. Henry Stenson, the BMW International Open. And, you know, later on in his career, last three wins have been against, you know, different class of players, I guess. But he still had to beat them. Um, you know, he's two for one in, in playoffs. He lost to Thomas Bjorn, which is no great shakes, you know, at Glen Eagles. So, to me, I think he's he's just maybe a slightly over, underrated, sorry, talent uh, based on that kind of inconsistency that he's had at times in his career. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, excited for him to carry it over. And we see guys like this on the deep. I mean, there's always one or two people that kind of come in with really good form that do make a little bit of noise in the major championships. Of course, it was Guido, you know, last year, uh, right around this time of the year and carried that into Tory. So, um, but let's, uh, let's dive right over. You mentioned off the top, you know, the odds of everybody um, being quite um, out there. I mean, 25 to one being the shortest golfer in the field. We haven't seen anything like that one, especially when we look over at Mexico and we see a golfer four to one uh, might get shorter with Daniel Berger withdrawing um, for John Rahm over there. So this field is complete opposite in the sense of no one at the top that we really see um, with the commanding odds. Um, but let's talk the course as well. I mean, we've seen this course, I think, at the 2014 Open Day España and the 2009. Yep. We've seen it on the Nordic Golf League a handful of times. Qualifying school, which was announced to be back. Tom, I am jacked Yes, Q school is back. That's Three, huge yeah, for the DP World Tour. It is it's such good content. Like I, I can't believe, you know, we talk about these kind of Netflix documentaries and things like that. That would be perfect content. Like, you yeah. know, we, we talk about sort of Ryan French and his account that just gets brought to yep. life through tweets, right? You know, he he's done his own thing, you know, different fire pit stuff and things like that. But, you know, if we can get a Q school documentary, that would be fascinating because it's so grueling. And even the best players in the world, they they fear going to that if they ever have to. Um, yep. So, yeah, I think, I think that's a really good addition. But going back to the... 25 to one, the field, it, it kind of just shows that nobody knows, like not even the people that are meant to be the smartest are setting the odds, right? Like that's kind of, what have we got? Eight players at 25 to one or similar prices. And then it jumps mm-hmm. to 40 to one. Like it's just so tough this week. It's so tough this season, as we keep mentioning, and it's not to make excuses. It just, I mean, you had a really consistent look at last week, at, you know, really good chances. Uh, I was dead for most of it, but you know, it, I think it's just a really, really tough event. And, you know, at least we've got a bit of course form for this one. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. And that course form, I would say uh, it has been dated for, for many, um, but I think it gives us an overall look at the kind of people we want to um, attack. I don't think it fits specifically a um, skill set. I hope it, it plays proper and difficult. I know uh, you talk kind of what your friend Charlie um, had talked about on the course and, and kind of what it showed, but we've seen, I think the 09 winner was 18 under, so it can get taken deep, but then we see the 04 or I mean 2014 and the winner was at four under there um, when it was played on the Nordic golf league. Um, one of the days and the lowest score was 65. And then the next day, the lowest score was like 70 um, when it was played. So, I mean, it, it can absolutely, and it's going to rain this weekend. It looks like um, potentially get, it's a spin. The, the other most difficult Spanish golf course is Valderrama. You know, and I think there probably can be some comparisons of grinded out um, type of golf and, and that type of golfer where you saw Wilco contend last time there. And then you see some of the shorter guys in the field. I mean, you see Matt Fitzpatrick win, you know, you see Min Woo Lee contend, but then you see John Catlin win there. You know, you, you have a ranging set of skills that can do well in Valderrama, but a, a proper test versus a birdie fest is, is really what I would like to see. Yeah, I think I think what it does, and you, you hit the nail on the head, is it doesn't suit a necessary skill set. It probably just brings more people into it, right? Like we're just, it's not long drive dominated. You can take it apart if you drive really well and, 
you know, I think the weather will dictate that a little bit. And I think just just generally the, the, the few hazards that are out there and, you know, it, it generally just favours iron players. I mean, Charlie said the same thing this week. He said the T's have probably moved around since he played there, but he, w- he would actually favour accuracy over Bombers. Now, um, we, we tend to say that about a lot of things and then, and then it never comes true. So I, I'd be a little bit hesitant, but I think just having that, that kind of mix of total driving, as they like to call it on the PJ Tour, where we want long and straight, which is, you know, it's obvious, isn't it, right? You know, we, we say every week, straight plane approach is important. It's the most obvious thing in the world. But uh, yeah, just good iron players, good off the tee. I don't think you necessarily have to be brilliant. Um, and then just you just want people that are in form, I think. Yep. Yep. I, I can agree with that. And it does. The selections can be vast. I think long shots are, are very well in play when we get a 25 hey, this favorite. Week. And we're going to yeah. be talking um, about them a lot. So for me, if I go to the top of the leaderboard, you know, I, I absolutely I the thing I struggled with is I could have almost bet like five guys 35 to one or make a strong, compelling case that there's no reason that Pablo can can be this long, you know, after he's done so well that, uh, you know, burned probably is considerably the best player in the field. And you can get him at 30 to one at some books. Adrian Otegi, you know, is, is once again showing how much form he is. He Spanish golfer and, you know, playing at a course, probably right up his alley. Perfect. You know, 35 to one Richard Bland, you could make the other argument that he has been the best golfer in this field over the last year, uh, available at 35 to one, you know, like all DraftKings hung a ton of good numbers here in the States on guys that are even longer than what they are overseas. I mean, you get deeper, you know, Marcus Armitage, you know, another golfer right there that you could probably make a compelling argument about Lori Cantor. If, if driving is going to be important, he did well at Valderrama before. I mean, I could go down the list, every golfer. Is there anybody that stands out to you or are you pushing back on the betting card? So, so the two that I wrote, then got rid of, then put back in, then got rid of, and, and just went back and forth were Adrian Otegi and Laurie Cantor. And I think Otegi has just been so good. Like third at Razal Kaima, fifth at the Qatar Masters, second last week, where he lost by one shot because Larafa Bell shot at 62, right? So he didn't really do anything wrong himself. Probably could say the same about Henny, although the bogey on 16 at the par five was obviously disappointing. So um, he's just been really, really solid. The only thing that kind of put me off a little bit about Otegi is he doesn't, play as well as I thought he would like in Spain like you look at his kind of recent record there it's not brilliant obviously apart from last week when he finished second um, but he's in better form he obviously has had success there in the past so um, he would be one and then yeah I, I think for me Laurie Cantor is is kind of banging on the door and can't seem to actually get let in uh, probably gets in his own way a little bit I think the tougher test may actually suit him because I think his skill set will come to the fore it's just with that comes the the opportunity for him to cock it up, which he, he tends to do, right? He just seems to make a, a mental error at some point. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's just inexperience. Cause I think because he's been his name's been around for a little bit, but he hasn't been at the level he's been at for so long. It's hard to quantify his actual experience. So, um, yeah, they would be the two for me, but I've actually gone further down. Yeah, I started further down too. Kind of a realization just now, as, as you mentioned that I can't do it. There used to be a golfer um, – Every time Valderrana came up, I, I thought that Sean, Sean Crocker would, would win there. Um, and I think the more that's evolved, I, I think Cantor is what we wanted Crocker to be this year. Um, yeah. And those type of skill sets, when it gets very difficult, I, I do think excel. It's like it's like a difficult test on the PGA Tour. I think it's like Zalatoris is, is built for that. Yeah. versus some of the other guys. This is like the, the light version of that. Here we are, 10 minutes into a show, we made a speed and a Zalatoris comp, um, you know, over on our Two very platform. rogue players as well. Yes, <laughs> 100%. But um, yeah, I think that, that it can if it plays difficult. And then they just kind of, they, they might grow, go out in the fifth to last group and, and win because it's just so so tight and it doesn't have that same type of, of feel it, to it. It's just to me, like, I think that out of the two, like, Cantor's better suited out of those two, him and Otegi, I just trust the Tegi more uh, in yeah. the heat of the battle, which is concerning to me about Cantor. So I've kind of just left them. But then Cantor's like double the price almost of a Tegi. So it's, I think it's kind of factored in, but gone further down. Yep. Yep. And um, I'll start with the first one um, for me. Um, and you, you mentioned it when we talked through it, you know, very, very deep is, I mean, Henny has been strong, man. Henny Duplessis. 
you know, week in and week out is competing. He's almost, if I had to like bring it back to the odds before, well, I, I can't even say that because he's probably priced similar. I was going to say like his run was like very similar, like Oliver, Oliver Becker's run. I mean, Becker top 10 again last week. <laughs> and he showed a little bit more upside in my opinion. Um, he birdies everything. He um, unfortunately got those three extra birdies taken away on Thursday afternoon. Yeah, we got his side, like, didn't we? When I sort of shouted Henny at you and then he told me they've been stolen. Yeah, he was three clear at one point, it seemed like. Uh, could he use those three, actually? Um, but no, I just think it, it continues for him. Um, you know, he's got an overall all around strong game um, and 55 to one in, in a field like this when you can just bet on some form out of anybody. Um, Henny, just to me, if I'm just throwing things out there, he, he's just too long for the best, one of the best informed golfers uh, on the tour. So I'm going to just go echo everything and, and join you as well. I sort of said to you last week, the only concern I had was whether he could do it outside of South Africa. And that, before I'd even got that sentence out, I kind of tried to revert back really quickly because I'd looked at some of his challenge tour, uh, challenge tour form from last year and he played well in kind of continental Europe. And and he showed it last week that like form is form, right? And these are the type of golf courses that just favour informed players. It's not ones that you get called specialists as such. I don't... You know, you don't want to be a core specialist at this golf course. It means you've been excused called too many times or you're on the Nordic Golf League too long. So um, it, it just favours those guys that are playing well. That sounds very basic, but that's what it is. Um, he's now had back-to-back chances to win. Uh, he's also, even when you go to like Qatar Masters 27th, you go to stronger events last year in South Africa, 7th and 3rd. Like he just keeps popping up now. And it's, you actually look down his career and every year from 2016 onwards, he's had a top three finish. But I know a lot of that's on like the South African tour, but that, that's pretty impressive. And like every year other than 2020, he's been second. So you, you want him to get that win. He's only got that one in 2017 and you want him to kind of kick on from there. But, you know, it, it doesn't happen for these South African guys too often. I think they have to take advantage. He's going to secure himself uh, full playing rights next year, I'm guessing, if he hasn't already. Um, and, and this will go a long way to doing that, I think. Yep. Totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I'm going to go on to where, again, this is DraftKings versus uh, potentially some of the markets. I think betting him down into the 40 uh, to one range is I'm okay with this next golfer. Um, and, and that is Victor Perez. Um, when, when we think Victor Perez, he's also one that didn't kick on and in, in, in to some degree that I would have, would have wanted. Um, you know, he really, what, two years ago when he won Alfred Dunhill, um, he almost won BMW PGA, top 10 the players, made it to the Elite Eight, I believe, or maybe even the final day um, at the match play. Um, I think he finished fourth. Did he finish fourth? I think he did. Um, you know, he just, it was like, okay, this guy's going to like top 10, top five a major. Like yeah. everything was ball striking to off the tee approach. Like really, really good. I thought the world of Victor Perez and it, everything was really, really tough almost from, from then on down. Um, I mean, we have literally since that, yeah, ninth, fourth, he has had, he finished eighth Portugal masters um, at the end of last year. And then his only other top 10 finish was last week in, in Spain since then. Um, and the last 54 holes, he played incredibly well. Um, I, I kind of like that that type of eliminating either their their worst round or also just looking at how they closed and maybe seeing who played the best over the last few days, who played the best in the weekend, just to get an idea of form. And sometimes you'll see guys that pop, and when Victor Perez pops, you know he he can compete with the best in the world. Um, so I think he is absolutely in play. 40, 45 to one in sixty sixes or sixty five, I believe he was at DraftKings um, this morning. So I, I I just like sticking with the hot hand in Victor Perez. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we were on him for the Saudi last year when he was Yeah, should have won. Fourth. Right, yeah, and DJ won. It was DJ that won, and, yep. and Justin Rose finished second because he broke my heart, and so did Kevin Knox. He got two yep. new bunkers. It was, it was one of those weeks where like he felt like he was playing to that kind of standard, and like you say, it's kind of just gone off a cliff. And But then I think what Victor Perez does has done in like last year and the last two years shows what a Laurie Cantor could do if he got a win and just got going like it can happen um so i think this is you know we're very quick to rule people out i'm concerned this 
maybe just a bit of a flash in the pan for Perez. And I can I can un- understand jumping back on because it's like 65 to 1. And he's one of the best players in the field if you just think about talent level. Um, because he almost like, he come back to form to the Portugal Masters last year, 8th after that run of missed cuts and then finished 24th. So I could see something like that, like kind of 8th, 12th, 8th, 15th, whatever. I just wonder if he's been out of that kind of heat for a little while to get the win. It, it feels like a long time ago since the Dunhill links, but the number's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, I guess when we don't have much lead in form, and I'm trying to I had to zoom out to not like rip through just the guys who who played well last week. Yeah, you know, to not bet Ross Fisher after you know excelling T to green once again, you know, to not like say, okay, this guy, you know, it was everything because it was four rounds, you know. So and for Victor Perez, it was three, you know. So like I let myself do that for potentially guys that are a little bit longer than if they showed that life for multiple weeks would get cut um, pretty substantially. So um, I, I think Victor uh, kind of fits that bill. Yeah, so I'm just going to go to Ross Fisher. I'm just going to I'm just going to roll into that there. Um, 15th last week, he was sixth after 54 holes. He's now been 18th or better in 50% of his starts this year. So that's, I think, four out of eight. I think he can still win in this company. I don't think, I think gone are the days where he was competing at WGC Mexico and things like that, but I do think he can still win here. So it sounds funny me saying I'd question whether Perez can still win and then backing Ross Fisher, right? But I don't know. It, it's just one. I think Ross Fisher's been so consistent this year that it feels like things have, like something would really have to happen for it to go wrong. Whereas I think Perez could be a little bit more volatile. So um, who has more upside? I guess Victor Perez. Um, I, I'd guess probably even Henny Duplicy, we've already mentioned. So I think it's just a consistency and what we've seen from Ross Fisher as a bank of a career that makes me still want to go for him. Yeah. And take my subtle comment at, at no you know, regard <laughs> as I, I did something on smaller samples, definitely uh, on multiple people. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's the, the Cantor, the Fisher, the um, Crocker, the, the people that I'm trying to whittle down my list. And if I, if I can't see them, you know, getting over the line on Sunday. And some guys I, I definitely still have questions with. Um, I will you know, say it's, this it's will hard. probably be the last Ross Fisher roll of the dice because I think this is probably three this year already. And I don't think I anticipated 2022 being a three-time Ross Fisher betting year. So um, he'll, he'll, I'll, we'll probably finish sixth this week. I'll give up on him because he double bogeyed down the back line and he'll probably win on the next start. So that's my, uh, my plan for Ross Fisher this year. Fair. I think that's uh, a fair assessment. <laughs> the next golfer for me... Uh, was one that um, I kind of kept on on the fringe a little bit and really d- dove into again zooming out, letting myself respect people that I think are, are very sharp in the market across the board. And a golfer was popping in multiple things that I, I thought was very close, and I, I couldn't leave out Fabrizio Zanotti. Um, he's a golfer. If I take back when I first started doing the DP world tour stats by hand, basically, um, you know, he, he would week in and week out be the best iron player out there. Um, and, and he has that in his arsenal still. I mean, he, he competed um, in some of the BJ tour events kind of in the uh, central, not central America, like the Caribbean uh, kind of swing a little bit, uh, but there's nothing really to Zanotti's form, um, especially this year that you say, okay, he, he is the reason that I'm selecting. But, but for me, what really stood out was two things. When you looked at um, the Valderrama form, looked at Valderrama, and then you looked at how people have played in Q school at this course. And he was one of the few guys, I, I would say actually the, the only guy in the field that was basically top five in both to me when you, when you looked at Tour tips are, are one of you know our, our site looking at tour tips, kind of ranking Valderrama form and Catalonia form. Um, Zanotti hit it, uh, yep. Bradley, and, and then you see he, he's a strong value on data, data golf. You see Coley's on him, and you see Brad Todd's on him. It's like if I leave this guy off when he was fitting the bill on multiple things I was looking at, I'm going to kick myself. And I, I think he has the type of game at this type of course that. He would just pound it to death and, and do well, but nothing in the recent form she screams that. But those guys win all the time on the European tour. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that I think that's the thing, right? Is I I kind of went down the line of I can see exactly why these people like him. I re- have the same respect for the same people that you have respect for. When you look at the location form, he's twenty seventh, twelfth, and fourth. His last three starts in Spain. 
I was just a little bit worried about his form turning off. Like it, it's been consistent without ever being great. And I haven't necessarily looked into it round by round like I maybe would do normally. Um, but I just remember like when we first started doing this show, like he was he was really solid, like you say, like just really, really good at his irons. And it, it still wasn't happening for him, right? And he was like seventh in Abu Dhabi and it it was a really good performance, but it never was better than his first round 66. And it, it just feels like to me, like he, he'll gain a bunch of strokes, play really, really well, finish 12th. I, I guess there's there's a lack of winning upside, which again, when I go through my card and finish off my card, I'm going to sound like a, a real idiot. But it, it just feels like to me, like, I guess I guess what I do is when when I know other people are on him, I have to try and justify it to myself even more so because like I, I feel like, you know, am I just going with a trendy pick and in the end I kind of jumped off of him, which, you know, I'll be the one that loses out. Yeah, I'm not one to make a selection because it's the popular one. It's it's more reinforcement when it yeah, was. Yeah, I mean you were already research. on him, right? It's it's not it's not like you've done it because of that. It's just one of those like I, this is why I try and avoid as much content as I can because I think the bias cre- like creeps in. Like I was like, okay, he's one on he's one on the short list, and I've ruled him out and put other guys in, and then I'm gonna kind of let people come in. I said to you in, in the message before we came on, like I'll probably let you talk me into him. So um, yeah, I, I don't know yet, but it, it just feels like he's a really really solid golfer without one that wins, which is gonna be really yeah. funny when we talk about the next golfer. Yeah, well, yeah, you you can go ahead. I'll I'll let you give your spiel. Scott Jameson is is a player that does not win. I don't. I think even his one win didn't even come in a four round event, right? I think he, he it was a, a rain shortened event. Um, but he's got five top twenty one finishes in seven starts in twenty twenty two. I think he's just probably in the form of his not form of his life. Maybe he's a bit strong, but he was tied tenth last week. He generally plays very very well in Spain. Um, just just very consistent. In the same mould of Ross Fisher, right? They've been doing this for years. He actually comes over from Florida. I think he lives not too far away from yourself. Um, you know, I think I think the fact that he gets that kind of winter practice in really helps him, comes out the blocks kind of pretty fast at the start of the year. Uh, I really like Scott Jameson. I think he's he's playing very solidly and I don't know how I can justify him having winning upside when I say Zanossi doesn't, but it's kind of probably a similar rule. Can I just prefer Jameson? Yeah, I, I skipped over Jameson on the list because I, I am with you um, on him. It feels too many times on a Thursday, Friday, even Saturday that he is right there in the thick of it. And it's just not reflective in overall stats. It's not reflected in the odds. I mean, long as 66 to one. Yeah, and, and also I'm going to pull up um, the tweet from Matt uh, SGT to Green, uh, you know, former caddy um, who dives into the stats. I thought it was very interesting because this happened when all of the states were asleep um, before something got going. Some scores from the last eight groups finishing up their third rounds this morning, the final seven holes. And he lists seven golfers who played at least plus four or worse in those seven holes, which was a two and a half, if not like larger stroke difference than what the, that was playing the, the previous day. So Jameson went plus five in those holes, um, you know, and just played. I mean, he was four clear when I went to bed. He had a 25% winning chance when I went to bed, um, you know, on, on Saturday night. And to wake up and he, he's not even in it, you know, that that happened like that. So if you, you rule out, you play the normal conditions, two, three strokes back, he, he's right there. Um, you know, Ken Holt fell by the wayside there and actually got MDF'd. Um, you know, somebody that I think is going to be on the short list next time I look at this, Paul Waring played plus eight in those final seven holes, just guys that just fell off the map. So I think that's an excuse once again for us to, to bet Scott Jameson to, to probably not even uh, get there on Sunday morning again. I think, I think you know, you, you probably think the same, but I think about Drew Matthews who does, uh, he does his sort of fancy golf bag stuff. And he always talks yep. about ruling out strokes gained from like a, like when it's a complete outlier of a, of a hole, right? And, yep. and uh, you'll probably do a better uh, way of explaining it to me. I've spoken to him a little bit through messaging. But to me, like I will throw out that that eight holes because – or five holes, whatever it was, because like it is important. It really is important because it's what Scott Jameson's done for a whole year, but or whole career, should I say. But he – is good enough to at some point just kind of guide his way home uh, and just be too good like for 54 holes and then have to cling on. He almost done it earlier in the year 
uh, where was it, Dubai or Abu Dhabi? He was he was really good for for fifty four holes, right? And you know the pressure tells, and I guess because he's such a veteran and someone that's been closed for so long, it's, it's almost it's almost bad to be as good as he is without winning. Does that make sense? Like he's just someone yep. that kind of has done it for so long that you kind of get this reputation of not being good enough when actually your game for fifty four holes of every event is is plenty good enough. Yeah, I would almost put it in. Um, I'm going to keep making PGA Tour references. This might be a new thing I do. Um, but like Sam, the year Sam Burns had before he broke through, like 54, 36 holes, he was there. 54 yeah. holes, he was there. Start of around four, he was there. You know, loses out in the back nine at Riviera, he's there. Like that was the progression until like he just, you know, gets him in clips. Now he's a young elite player. It's not Scott Jameson, but um, the, the form regardless of the profile is, is similar in that sense. And it's just a matter of time. Um, yeah, but let's, it's, just, it's, it's great. Like the bank of form is for his whole career is just so solid. Yep. Yep. Let's, uh, let's do some quick hitters with our long shots here. Um, uh, I think we each have two in this range. If I don't say so, let's you start off uh, with your first one. Yeah. So Jack senior for me is his last eight events in Spain. He's had four top 10 finishes and a 34th against three missed cuts. Uh, so when he does make the weekend in Spain, just plays very, very well. Three of those top tens and come his last four start, including last week. And he hasn't played much. And I don't know what, if there's a reason for that. I haven't necessarily dived in, but he was 75th in Dubai. I think it was there in a year and then 10th last week. And you just look, and he ended last year, sixth at the Open Deer Spain, yes, seventh in Mallorca. He just clearly loves his country. And we saw a lot of Jack Senior last year. He kept popping on our screens and didn't, hasn't got it done, doesn't look like he's definitely going to get it done on a Sunday. But I just thought, at whatever it was, 150 to one or whatever he was, like that was a really big price on someone that's clearly got the talent and, you know, the love for the region as well. Yeah, he, he's another one that just see him closing up his round on Sunday. And he was like, okay, he was in like a final three group, like, and, and didn't sniff the coverage. Yeah, I think um, there's enough in there with Senior. I actually have three. I'm going to quick it two of them. Eddie Pepperell uh, would be my first one. Old Eddie P coming in. Um, and you can see life out of Eddie's shows. Um, and he's somebody I think they can carry over for him um, when we know his pedigree um, a little bit. I, I'll probably really like him if he, he hits his irons like he did this week. Um, does it again next this this coming week and then shows up at the British Masters. We were on him last year and it seemed like he was a surefire back going to that and he absolutely delivered um, until you know the back nine um, on Sunday. He was he was the favorite. Um, you know, so I think Eddie has shown that for us. He he did that last week. Um, so that's one. I think that's a lot more reason I can talk about him than the next golfer. I'm gonna do some explaining here because I'm not sure we've put him up before, um, but Gavin Green's kind of giving me the feels a little bit. I think if you throw out his first round at Qatar, okay? So you yep. throw out his first round at Qatar. The last seven rounds that Gavin Green has played is up there as like top three or four in this entire field. Um, and I'm not going to get away from showing at the end of Qatar in two rounds when he, he started at like 150th and he finished inside the top 10. Um, at Qatar and he gained 10 strokes putting in two days. Like I, I, I respect that that happened, but last week, I mean, Gavin green is a really good putter. I think that's like what he's built around. But if you look at last week, he actually lost strokes to the field, um, with his, his putter and his irons were really, really good. If you're going to combine his iron play with his elite, uh, putting, I, I think there's just enough, I mean, he's 300 to one here on DraftKings. Um, even, you know, 150, 200, like i definitely think there's enough in Gavin green because we have seen him blitz fields. I think first round leaders are really good bet always with Gavin green because he can do it for 18 holes. So, but I think, um, he's incredibly intriguing. Yeah, we, we bet Gavin Green somewhere, or, or I talked myself into Gavin Green last year, and I think it might have been like Wentworth, where like he opened with like a 78, and then he looked like he was going to shoot like a 65 on the second day and make the cut, and then just went like double. I do, I think you're over. right, yes, I remember that. I think I think that's what happened, and that is Gavin Green all over, right? But when you look at it, 5th and 23rd is last two starts, and you're getting 300 to 1, and it's a guy that has won on the Asian Tour, um, you know, I think he's won a development tour as well. Hasn't won at this level yet, but has the game that's absolutely fine for it. Like he's a really, I think he's kind of a big hitter, right? He's, he's yeah. kind of long and decently straight when he's on form as well. Um, might be a bit of a lazy comparison, but I kind of think of him as like a, 
like an affid bar right just a bit mercurial and just kind of can turn up at any time and has that ability to, to kind of take over without actually having a consistency um there's yeah. a reason he's 500th or whatever it is in the world but he's also better than that suggests yep yep i like it okay one more each your guy uh so jackson bra is well i guess what well, we align on this one so yes. you have two left so okay yes. Uh, you talk, Jack. I'll, I'll just back you up. Yeah. So Jack Singh Barari, we, we've mentioned him a couple of times before he got injured when we first started the show. And then at the start of this year, we kind of mentioned he was coming back and to look out for him, right? 15th last week. Closes with a 66, something that you've just referenced that you love to see. Uh, finished off really well. 15th, 23rd, and now 15th in his last three starts in Spain. Clearly likes, you know, playing in this uh, region. Coming, you know, I like to see a goal for the the only reason he's lost form is because he had an injury. Like he lost form, had surgery, then he was out for a long time, so he was rusty. Comes back 15th, bang, on to next week, and I think he's good enough to at least top five this week. Yeah, yeah. He's available at 600 to 1 um, at DraftKings here, so top 5, 10, probably some 20s there. Um, two other things on St. I liked. Only time played at Valderrama, 15th. I didn't yep. mention that about Jamison either. Jamison has a really good Valderrama track record. He does. Yeah. Um, and then also on Singh Brar, his irons showed life on his last miscut. His ball striking was really good. He backed up those irons um, last week as well. So there's definitely enough in there um, at 600 to 1. Uh, close us out with a golfer that I, I was intrigued on too. Pedro Oriol is someone that has just kind of been around for a long time, doesn't really get it done. Two starts he's made in 2022, Sky, and I knew you'd like him because both of those starts, Nordic Golf League, second on this golf course at the Andalusia, whatever it is, Nordic Golf League event, sixth at the Spanish Masters. It's been a long time since he played well kind of on the European or DP World Tour, but he was sixth in Tenerife last year. And if you remember, that was like a really, really low scoring event. Um, yeah, and, you know, it just comes back, plays in his home country, plays well. Depends what that Nordic Golf League, how that translates, but we've, we've already seen it with with Kinholt, as you referenced sort of earlier on in a couple of shows before. Like, if if we can just get a top five out of him, he's another one that's really big odds and and plenty good enough. So, Gavin Green, Pedro Oriol, Jackson Bra, probably great, like, DraftKings play do they have an event and, yep. uh, you know, just brilliant long shots for top 10, top 20, I think. Yep, 100%. Oriel used to be a flusher, too. Um, really good with the irons. Yeah, enough in there that he was tweeting a lot. He was, like, super excited to be back into the field, especially at this course. Uh, that's always good. I mean, if, if I'd have said that, I probably would have put more money on. So that's, that's you know, I'm glad I didn't see it because I'm one of those, like, oh, my God. You know, when you do those hype videos, Wyndham Clark is, like, the best golfer in the world on Instagram and doesn't ever play that well in golf. He's just really, really good at Instagram. And he has all these hype videos and he's sponsored by Nike. So you think he's the, the, the absolute nuts and isn't. But, That's you know, funny. Pedro Oriol. Cool. All right. Let's close us out here, Tom. So run through your car one more time. Yep. So I think we, we both align on Henny Duplessis and Scott Jameson. Uh, Ross Fisher is in there for me. I'll, I'll give him one more shot. Uh, Jack Senior coming into the, the kind of long shot territory with Jackson Bra and Pedro Oriol. Awesome. I am on Henny Duplassi, 55 to 1. Victor Perez, 65 in the States here, 45s, you know, overseas I'm good with. Scott Jameson, 66. Fabrizio Zanotti, 100 to 1. Eddie Pepperell, 150. Gavin Green, 300. Jack Singh Bra, 600 to 1. We'll be back next week. British Masters, um, site of last time Guido losing in the playoff. Maybe there's enough of Guido that. 36 holes give us a bigger number the following week and we all jump on for a win. It, it feels like we're going to get a better event next week. And I don't know what the field's like yet. I mean, I saw some people trying to speculate who would be in and I thought it was a bit optimistic. I saw people like Rory McIlroy's name floating around. That's probably not going to happen. Um, but I think if you can just get those kind of players that we, you know, we rely on, you know, that, that can kind of lead the charge and get some Ian Poulter's back and things like that, that we can kind of push the prices out on some of the, the guys we want to bet every week. Uh, that's a good sign. Yep. Amen. Well, I appreciate you, Tom, as always, um, and let's have a big week.